All right, it's good to be here. Dr. Patrick Blocker back live again after a week, uh, testing out last week, and I'm here with my good friend, Lauren Seidler. So Hi. Uh, this is going to be fun. He um, has been a very, very valuable friend for the last few years in terms of just helping me see my way through a lot of social, psychological, and political issues, and I cannot wait to talk about some of the things you and I have debated for at least three or four years, and really just to get a better idea of what acupuncture is and what TCM is, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions that a lot of people think about. So if you just tell us a little bit about yourself, what got you into traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture? So um, I'm actually a second generation practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture. My father is licensed in practices as well. Uh, that being said, a lot of people think that that was my primary influence that compelled me to practice. Mm. However, I have three other siblings who don't give a crap yeah. <laughs> about yeah. Chinese medicine. Right. And so I really don't think that that was the, uh, that was the exposure, but definitely not what compelled me. Mm. In fact, when I was a child, I've always had this like, inexplicable interest in East Asia. Um, I remember being in elementary school and these two little Japanese girls came to class and I went to them and was just like, can you teach me Japanese? Like I was just so, right. so enthralled by, by that, by them and by what I, as an, as a, you know, a eight year old could conceive of East Asian culture. And as I grew up, it became apparent that that um, Chinese culture was definitely what I was interested in. Mm. And that resulted in me studying Chinese martial arts and then ultimately studying Chinese philosophy, Chinese language, mm. studying abroad in China and studying language there. Mm. And all the while that this was happening, I was you know, in a household of Chinese medicine. So I was receiving treatments from my father when I was ill. And I wasn't content just to be treated. I was always curious as to why he was doing what he was doing, what he was right. doing and why he was doing it. Right. So there was always a, curio a theoretical curiosity there as opposed to just being the recipient of the treatment. Okay. And so as everything kind of came together, uh, all my disparate interests, you know, Chinese culture, Chinese language, Chinese philosophy, I guess that's not, that's not disparate, but, um, but, what, but that, then I went to massage school, they studied philosophy in general, and all of these just seemed to coalesce in Chinese medicine because the beauty of something like Chinese medicine is that it's the practical application of Chinese th philosophy, philosophy, Chinese mm -hmm. metaphysics and Chinese philosophy. Yeah. And so um, it's pretty unique in today's world to be able to take something that evolved wholly independent of kind of the Western philosophical worldview and practice it and actually have it produce tangible effects. That's cool. And I think... I, I share with you a very similar story in terms of how I came to the psychology world, my old man being a shrink and whatnot. So you and I are very similar in that way. And it's not surprising we turned out to be very similar kinds of creatures in that way. One thing that I heard you say that I think we should probably spend some time pulling apart is the idea of how there was a philosophy and a metaphysics that drove this particular kind of medicine to develop and function a certain way. And one of the things you and I have talked about a lot is the fact that there's a lot of spiritual woo-woo nonsense that uh, basically, I don't remember the phrase you used last time, it was something like hippies that uh, practice acupuncture and TCM. And what is the real truth there in the sense of like, how much does the metaphysics, the religion, the, the philosophy in terms of something more on the spiritual side actually influence what you do or is that really more of an academic point for you? Um, no, it's actually very important and that's why I actually spend a lot of time studying the historical record, the written record, because my interest is really to attain the same results that my medical ancestors were writing about. Mm. And my personal belief is that if I don't practice like them, I can't expect to have the same results. Sure. So it's important to understand historically what happened in the last 75 years to make Chinese medicine into what it's popularly known as today, and what happened in the last 2,500 years to understand where Chinese medicine actually came from. Right. In terms of the last 75 years, um, Chinese medicine underwent a huge transformation with the, um, the creation of the People's Republic of China. Okay. And people don't really realize that people, the people, People's Republic of China is a communist country, but communism is a Western philosophy. 
So Ch China at that time wholeheartedly embraced Western philosophy, and that included science, medical science in particular. The only reason that Chinese medicine survived in China was because China was so broke after World War II that it didn't have the, the finances nor the uh, infrastructure to offer medical care out in the countryside. Mm. So what they did was they were like, well, it's just cheaper if people go and pick their own herbs as opposed to us trying to pre produce drugs and send them out there. Mm. So they took, there was a, you know, a small number of medical doctors who were trained. They took these medical doctors, sent them out into the country, the countryside, and they said, okay, I want you to collect a group of people and teach these people kind of a bare bones Western medicine, bare bones Eastern medicine, and then send them out into these villages that are all isolated from each other. Okay. And these were called the barefoot doctors. So Chinese medicine was standardized and abridged at this per at this point in history because it was ne it needed to be assimilatable in a very short amount of time since there was the formation of a new country yeah. and there was no infrastructure to support them the majority of the population which was in the countryside the peasants. Interesting. So that Chinese medicine is ultimately what made it to the United States when Richard Nixon, President Nixon, opened China to the West. There was a there was a journalist who was out there following that story who had appendicitis, had to get his appendix removed, so he had it removed in China. And acupuncture was part of his recovery, and he was really thrilled by that. He wrote a story about it, and that created this dialogue between China and the West. Mm. Um, and so we then began taking what was happening at that time in China, which again had already gone through a transformation because of the influence of Western philosophy in China. Interesting. So that being said, even though like there's this dialogue happening and China had you know westernized a ton at this point and was doing a lot of faux science, kind of um, doing a lot of a lot of uh, pseudoscience to try and corroborate a lot of what was going on with Chinese medicine. Okay. The people who really gravitated towards Chinese medicine in the West were the um, white hippies. And so the, the thing about the white hippies is that they kind of drew their philosophical traditions from kind of theosophy, which preceded it. And um, so they had these big preconceptions about how the universe operates yeah. with ideas of energy and then that that got exacerbated by the influx of Indian gurus at the time talking about reincarnation and talking about past lives and all that stuff. And so there, there is this there is this theosophical movement that orientalized with India and then mm. suddenly this Chinese thing came in which has a very, very archaic and arcane medical terminology mm -hmm. that to somebody who is not a sinologist and has not spent lots of time researching the literature are going to look at that and they're going to be like, this is just magic. And they were looking for magic, magic. at that time. Yeah. And so they were like, okay, Chinese medicine is the way to go. It's magic. It's magic made real. And, yeah. and that heavily influenced the practice of Chinese medicine up until today. And in fact, many people now, if you go to see an acupuncturist or an herbalist, a, a TCM practitioner of any kind, um, if you go from one office to the next to the next, the m most likely you're going to have dramatically different versions of treatment Wow! because most people are I integrating with that a bunch of disparate met uh, modalities ranging from like you, the use of nutraceuticals, dietetics, and, um, and Western medicine ideas with Reiki, with past life regression, with shamanic healing, with crystal waving, with all kinds of stuff. So unfortunately though, nobody sits there and distinguishes saying like what I'm going to do here is not Chinese medicine, just so you know, FYI. They just include this all in their treatment. And so I've had people talk to me saying like, oh yeah, you know, I got Chinese medicine and they were doing all this muscle testing stuff with me. And I'm like, that's not Chinese medicine. Mm. So like whatever it was that you had, um, it might have been effective, it might have been great, but it's not Chinese medicine. So before you go on, maybe you can just give us a very simple, concise definition of traditional Chinese medicine because uh, I understand because I've been talking with you for years about it, but 
people who might watch this might not quite understand really what it is. So Chinese medicine is the application of typically acupuncture, moxibustion, cupping, herbal therapy, and soft tissue manipulation under the guidance of Chinese medical theory. That would be the really textbookish kind of definition. So those five practices, those five separate practices through the philosophical theoretical lens of everything that's been written down for 3000 years or so. To be fair, like 2,500. Okay. Yeah. Which by the way, you will get, you will get people uh, saying Chinese medicine is 3000 years old, 4,000 years old. I've heard 5,000 years. And whilst maybe the archeological record might have found some shards of something that might have been used for medical therapy or whatever. Chinese medicine as it exists today can trace back its lineage to one book in particular called the Huang Di Meiting. And this book was written roughly 22, 2300 years ago. Okay. So be very like, always be dubious when people are like, Oh, it's, you know, 5,000 year history. And you're like, yeah. no, actually it really isn't. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've only read a few reviews um, of different kind of meta-analyses and things like that, and basically they always kind of reference this 3,000-year period, so that's where I pulled that number from. Yeah, it's so in terms of the written record, the absolute oldest text that I believe that we have found is called the Ma Wangdui Manuscript, and that was from a Han Dynasty tomb that precedes the Huang Di Meiting by 300 years or so, okay. but what's interesting and really important about that text is it's starkly different from what shows up in terms of medical theory. Um, it, there's a, a huge, dramatic, actually revolutionary change in thinking that took place in that two to three hundred year period mm. that is super important that everybody should know about. Mm -hmm. Because in the Ma Wangdui manuscripts, disease is largely um, understood to be caused by demonic possession, uh, parasitic possession more, less less like parasitic infection, though probably some of that was derived from actually observing worms and things coming out of people. Huh. But there was a lot more of this idea of magical causes of disease. And so you saw um, de uh, exorcism, incantation, talismans, a lot of that stuff showed up, as well as some of the early iterations of what would later become oxygen therapy and then acupuncture therapy. Okay. I don't think acupuncture is actually mentioned at all in those texts. Um, moxibustion for sure. And then even the channel system that we use, which is those lines on the body mm -hmm. that everybody sees on charts and everything, that system is in an earlier iteration and different from how it ended up being codified in the Neijing. Okay. And so once you get to the Neijing though, you have a starkly naturalistic understanding of how disease works. And so, the, in fact, the only time that magical ideas are referenced is the, there's two references to shamanism um, in the Neijing. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, and what most Sinologists believe is quite diplomatically, they reference these shamans in the past tense, saying, once upon a time, there, there was a time when people got ill and all they had to do was, you know, say the right words and change the way they think or something. And then the, the problem would get better. And, but now it's not like that. Mm. And they use the character shaman, the character that Chinese character that means shaman in those lines. And truthfully, shamanism still existed at the time that those doctors were writing and existed long, long, long afterwards. And, and of course, when you got it, when uh, religious Taoism was very sh shamanistic, Buddhism is very shamanistic. And so shamans never went away. So to have this text speak of shamans in a past tense is why most people think they were kind of pejoratively, like mm. in a diplomatic way, they weren't being mean. They weren't just saying these guys are outright quacks, but they were saying like, look, this is this is what's really happening. Yeah. Right? This is how the world works. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. And so it's really important because you do see kind of a a similar movement that was transpired. So a similar movement that was happening in the early Han Dynasty uh -huh. happened in the Enlightenment period in Europe, where it was not about God or spirits or something orchestrating the universe. Yeah. There were natural laws, and if you understood these laws, then you can you understand how the body works, and therefore how disease works, and therefore how to treat it. Interesting. Yes, yeah, truly remarkable, actually. I mean, for the time, absolutely. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. It's surprising actually that China didn't go through something akin to the scientific revolution considering they, met, they made such a huge cognitive leap. So that probably has something to do with the fact that these more mystic spiritual traditions like Taoism at the time, Buddhism at the time, Hinduism at the time probably had more of a hold. Would that be the reason that maybe this more intellectual, as you described, movement didn't get to play as much? I mean, look, studying the... I don't study literature outside of the medical um, of the medical field. Just curious. So it would be hard for me to say um, how much they were influencing things. But at least when you look at the medical literature, even over a thousand year period, the the authors that continue to exert influence well beyond their their demise mm. are the authors that didn't mention anything about magic, didn't mention anything about spirits, didn't add, mention anything about possession. Um, I'm reading a, an 800-year-old text, or roughly 800-year-old text right now. He never mentions anything about medicine, mm. or sorry, spirituality. magic, yeah. um, spirituality, in the sense that there's anything uh, outside of the universe making the universe happen. Um, there's certainly lines in there about the importance of meditation, calming the mind, controlling the emotions, those kinds of things, which do fall under the purview of spirituality today. Sure. But um, you go back further in time, uh, there's a book, called the Shanghan Zha Bing Lun. This one was written about 1800 years ago and is the most important text for Chinese herbalism. And this text also, basically no references to demon, demonic possession, hmm. spirits, nothing like that. All of it is materialistic. Now the laws that, that the Chinese understood the universe to operate under are different from the ones that we recognize today through physics. Right. And that is in part why they didn't have the same kind of technological revolution that and scientific revolution that took place in the West. Um, I think also part of what influenced that was a bit of a distinction in what the philosophies gravitated towards. So this is now, this is my own speculation. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a sinologist. I'm not a scholar of this stuff. However, what my impression is reading the literature is that in the West, especially, especially from the Semitic traditions, the, the, the world, was meant for humanity to rule, to conquer, to do, to plunder, to do whatever it wants with. Mm. Um, it, and theref therefore, like we are above the world. Whereas in Chinese philosophy, the emphasis was always to find one's place within the world. And so there's a bit, you can see this actually very well illustrated in Chinese scroll paintings, where you'll have a massive mountain and forests and waterfalls and in the very corner you have a tiny little house and a tiny little fisherman mm -hmm. to illustrate that humanity is a very small part of a much grander universe sure sure and so you can see that 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 philosophical idea being portrayed in the art and so i i presume or i assume really that the idea that we have a place in the world as opposed to we have a place dominating the world made a big difference in terms of what people were looking for in their philosophical and scientific scientific exploits. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's a, an important distinction in terms of how different philosophically informed medical systems function, because I think that's a fair, probably in, in your mind, a fair critique of Western medicine that there is this almost omnipotence of how humans should be and let's say function with things like parasites in the body and then whatnot. Yeah. So on that order, like help me understand what you see having practiced this and having studied it a fair amount, like what do you see are the main problems with Western medicine and how TCM fills a gap in some way and then kind of vice versa what that looks like? Um, Western medicine was largely born out of battlefield medicine. Um, it, the treatment of severe injuries and infectious diseases. Um, I think I think the biggest problem with Western medicine actually is it applies a a, a germ theory model to non-germ theory problems. And so- Can you spell that out a little bit? Totally. Like germ theory suggests that you, that every disease or at least every infectious disease is moderated by a pathogen, mm -hmm. the thing that causes the disease. Once you eradicate that pathogen, there is no disease. And that is very true for infectious diseases. But in any functional disease, and mo 
any functional disease such as IBS or, or autoimmune diseases such as Crohn's um, or multiple sclerosis, any of these diseases are not moderated by single pathogens, which makes them far more complicated to treat and much more difficult to understand, which is partially why they elude treatment in Western medicine. Mm. I actually, not recently, a few months ago, I, I, met a, um, I met a gastroenterologist and I, I told him that I practice Chinese medicine. He's like, oh, you know, I refer all my IBS patients to acupuncture. It's like, really? He's like, yeah, because like, they, they all get really good results from it. And frankly, Western medicine doesn't have much to offer IBS. Hmm. So I think the big problem in terms of, in Western medicine is the fact that they're still kind of caught on this reductionist idea that you there is always one thing causing the disease. And if we just find that one thing and, mm. we, and we find its antithesis and, or its antidote, then, then we'll cure that disease. Okay, that makes sense to me. So how does TCM, whether it's one of those five particular methods or a philosophical concept or, or more scientific concept, kind of plug that gap? So the interesting thing about traditional Chinese medicine as that is that as it is as old as it is, yeah. it doesn't have germ theory. It has certain ideas that begin to approximate germ theory. Of course, right. they didn't have microscopes. They couldn't actually see germs. Right. Um, nevertheless, um, because of that, most of the therapies in Chinese medicine don't actually directly treat the pathogen itself. It treats the physiology or the or um, pathophysiology of the patient. Mm. And so this is why Chinese medicine is oftentimes looked at as being really effective for chronic um, degenerative and functional disorders because most of these disorders aren't really related to a specific pathogen, they're related to dysfunctioning of the physiology. So maybe more of a metabolic issue and less of a like totally a virus or a bacteria. Itself. Totally. Now there are herbs, very there are a number of herbs actually that ex that exert um, significant antimicrobial effects. And a lot of those herbs are used in formulas for like herbal prescriptions for bacterial infections, for sure. Mm. But for any of the uh, herbal prescriptions that would classically be indicated for viral infections, obviously we're not giving herbs to kill viruses because if, if you could just take a plant to kill a virus, then the common cold would be cured. Yeah. And there is no cure for the common cold. So. Right, no, exactly. <laughs> so it's not that simple. And if you really probe the literature, you see that in the presence of some of these infections, we're not really using anything that's particularly antimicrobial, which is also why sometimes you'll see some of the, the literature and they'll go, well, there's nothing in this formula that should work on this problem. And that's because if you're looking at, if you're looking for some active ingredient that's gonna be antibiotic or something like that, or antiviral, mm -hmm. you may not find it, but that's be because the, the Chinese doctors weren't thinking of treating it that way. They were right. trying to make the patient sweat or they're trying to, um, thermoregulate the patient, make them feel warmer or right. something like that. So sure, maybe ginger doesn't have anti antiviral properties, but if somebody's feeling really, really cold, which is quite common in the common cold or especially influenza, yeah. ginger's really, really nice for them because it makes them feel functional. So so it's, it's less about curing some underlying disease and more about managing certain symptoms in, in that particular case, at least. I mean, that would be a, that would be probably how Western medicine describes it. Okay. However, there have been a number of cases where I have given diaphoretic herbs. These are herbs that induce sweating uh -huh. in cases that from a Chinese perspective are um, that diaphoresis is indicated in treatment. And that's typically like influenza, common colds and viral infections with, with a uh, cold as a pronounced symptom uh -huh. and inducing sweating and heat in the patient. The next day they the problem's gone. So now that's a small sample size. I cannot say that I cannot say like dis distinct distinctly that I did anything in particular, but I've seen it happen a number of times. So Fair enough. and it's written in the literature for 2000 years. So <laughs> we we'll do it. So there's, and I think that's something to point out is if you think about the difference between what we call Western medicine and how long it's been around and how long it's been more systematically studied and documented, there's, a, a, I think, a rather significant disparity between TCM and Western medicine in that way, where people like Hippocrates and, you know, what most Western medicine kind of professionals consider very brilliant thinkers are actually very young compared to traditional Chinese medicine. I think actually Hippocrates would have been a contemporary of, of the origins of Chinese medicine. At the time? Mm -hmm. Hippocrates was writing um, before the Common Era. 
China, and the Huangdi Neijing was written maybe only two hundred years before Common Era. So right, but I, I, contemporaries. I'm thinking more in the terms of like, not the specific decade, but more in the sense of how people have applied concepts from Hippocrates and whatnot. Because um, you know, there's a huge gap. It seems like not only because of maybe logistics, like. How did those ideas travel out of Greece and whatnot? Whereas in China, since it's a huge, just huge area, a very interconnected culture, comparatively speaking, I think those ideas were able to flourish and be replicated more, let's say, frequently, consistently, compared to, you know, 300 BC to maybe 600 AD, etc., in you know Western cultures. At least that's the way I've read a lot of the literature on Western medicine is things didn't get to be systematically studied for a long time mm. after Hippocrates, or it seems like that's not the case with TCM. Well, I would I would like to distinguish between academic or scholarly Chinese medicine, which is the Chinese medicine that has been handed down through the literary, the literary the historical record. Yeah. Um, and then Chinese folk medicine. Yeah. Um, and so there are, there, there is a huge difference between these two. In the academic world in China, there, that's where you get a lot of the theorization of how Chinese medicine works, yeah. and where, where you have people who are actually educated enough and have the means to actually write down their ideas. In the folk traditions, you'll have a lot of people who were, who they grew up in families that had some medical knowledge of some kind. They knew that if they they gave these herbs under these con like with these symptoms that the symptoms would go away. They couldn't tell you why it worked. They just knew. It'd be like the little 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 grandmother cures or something like that. I see that. And a lot of Chinese medicine is actually built out of that. And there have been throughout the throughout the centuries various doctors traveling around China making compendiums of every medical practice out there. Okay. So um it, it's not so, it's not so, the, the progression and evolution of Chinese medicine is not so linear. The, 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 the historical record is there, the written record is there, um, but there are tons of different, different influences and tons of different practices that evolved independently of what the, liter liter the literary record is showing. That makes sense to me. And I, I find myself wondering then about, let's say, common practices with regard to traditional Chinese medicine and everything that you do, because you, you listed off the five different components earlier, but I, I'm found myself wondering, basically, what do you do the most? And then what do you treat the most commonly? Like what symptoms or what kind of illnesses, so to speak? Um, so acupuncture and herbalism are definitely what I do the most. Okay. Um, moxibustion would, would be a third. Moxibustion being the use of prepared mugwort, which is an herb that smolders very nicely, kind of like incense, and it mm. emits a lot of heat, and we'll actually use that to heat up regions of the body, including acupuncture points. Okay. Um, in terms of pathologies that I treat, most commonly I'm treating musculoskeletal pain because that's the number one reason people even think to go see an acupuncturist. Mm. Um, however, I do treat a lot of digestive problems as well. Okay. And, um, and is, yeah. Now, it's also important to note, too, that Chinese medicine classifies disease in a different way than Western medicine. Yeah. Um, the classification of disease is called nosology, and every medical system has its own nosology, which is why yeah. if anybody from a Western medical background opens up a Chinese medicine book and starts looking at all these clusters of symptoms, these syndromes, they'll kind of be like, I don't know how any of this is related. And that's because they, the way that Western medicine understands and classifies diseases is just is different. And again, kind of goes down that germ theory idea of looking for one pathogen causing the problem. Right. Um, and as such, that's led a lot of Western, of Western, but Western medicine people as well as people just in the West in general, making the, I think the false conclusion that Chinese medicine is holistic medicine. I think, I don't think Chinese medicine really is holistic in I think it's just that because we we string together symptoms in a different way, it makes it appear as though we are holists. I see. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, again, as a you know uh, a researcher and interested in data science, that's a perfectly reasonable pursuit if you're really trying to think about a problem critically. Is how do we look at the data in different pattern ways? Mm -hmm. 
Right. So, okay. So like for an example of somebody, somebody's chief complaint is anxiety. Yeah. One of the first things I'll begin asking them about is their digestive health. Yeah. And now that this is a very popular idea in the West today. Yeah. But, and that's only within the last 10 years really. Um, but this has been a really important idea in Chinese medicine for thousands of years. Hmm. And to somebody who doesn't really understand that there is that the, the gut brain access is a real thing, then if somebody says I'm anxious and then I say, well, how's your digestion? It's going to look either like I'm crazy or that I'm holistic. And it's not, it's neither. It's really that Chinese medicine understands there to be a direct relationship between digestive health and psychological health of a certain kind. Um, not all psychological um, problems would be necessarily attributed to gut health, which I'm sure Western medicine says the same thing. Yeah. But, um, but nevertheless, um, if the symptoms, if the psychological symptoms are there, then what, then we will look for concurrent digestive symptoms and that will confirm our diagnosis. And this is also really important because Chinese medicine upholds a reciprocal relationship between say psychological symptoms and physiological symptoms uh, or physical symptoms. And it's a bad, bad distinction, kind of an arbitrary distinction, but yeah. But nevertheless, it's still unfortunately it's in the it's in the ethos of our culture to look at them as being distinct, and so I think that's Western medicine's fault. Honestly. <laughs> it's it's Descartes' fault. It's Descartes' fault. <laughs> <laughs> but um, nevertheless, that's totally different conversation. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, Chinese medicine has long observed, has long upheld that uh, that emotional states of any kind have predictable effects on the body's physiology of and course. protracted emotional states will therefore result in histological and eventually morphological problems. Right. And so what, and then on the other side of that, those same histological or morphological problems predispose somebody to certain emotional states. Mm -hmm. And so once the physical symptoms, um, such as say somebody has gastritis because they're so they're so stressed all the time. Right. Um, once the gastritis is there, it makes it exponentially more difficult to change the psychological state. And so Chinese medicine, then, for the most part, because there has been there's yet to be any kind of physical medicine that can actually change somebody's mind. So um, we uh, we. <laughs> they're trying. We're trying. But they're really trying. <laughs> trust me. Um, but pharma. until until today, there still has not been really an effective way to actually change somebody's thinking. And so, as such, even in Chinese medicine, we'll approach psychological symptoms through physical means by treating physical symptoms. So that makes me wonder specifically in your let's say just the last year of practicing. Um, like what percent of your clients are showing up with pretty significant or obvious psychological symptoms like depression, anxiety, or hypervigilance, or something of that nature? 100%. All of them. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not terribly surprised. <laughs> I, think, I think the human condition is to be neurotic. <laughs> well, that's why I meant like is it significant anxiety or is it just like, you know, living is, is tough? Um, I mean... Uh, by significant, you mean dysfunctional? Yeah. Okay. I would. I don't. I have not had any cases. You know what? I don't think I've actually treated anybody who's been dysfunctionally um, anxious or dysfunctionally depressed. Okay. Most people are functional, but life is life is suck. Life sucks. No. See, that's interesting because I have the kind of inverse experience with what I do in treatment, where perhaps. Maybe this is an exaggeration, but it doesn't quite feel like that when I'm thinking about it right now. Most people that I treat, um, both clinically at uh, the treatment center where I work, as well as when I do coaching with people and whatnot, it seems like all of them have issues with their eating behavior, with their digestion. That's why I said 100%. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like... Where is the line between, I guess, in your mind, a maladaptive emotional process from the perspective of TCM versus um, something that's just ancillary or unre or quasi related to their physiological malady? Yeah, I I don't think is there a clear line. 
Uh, no, I do not think there's a clear line. Okay, I mean, enough. if somebody's able, if somebody's able to pay their bills and not kill somebody, then I think that's pretty. Fun. I think it's fair to say they're functioning. <laughs> but um, but no, I, I think that's why my, my initial impulse was to say a hundred percent. Okay. I don't see. I have never seen one person who does not complain of sleep problems or um or overthinking. In fact, I would say 110% people have overthinking problems, and which is part, which is in part why why everybody has digestive symptoms. Yeah. So from a Chinese perspective, it's the the idea that there's psychological symptoms and there are physical symptoms is completely arbitrary because we have a theory um, that there is a physiological process that underpins um both yeah and so that that disease process is ultimately what causes those two things so right. we're not tr technically treating the gastritis and we're not technically treating the anxiety we're treating the 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 um pathophysiological process that's resulting in the two and so right. there will be lines in the nadine which talk about overthinking causes um binding Mm. Which is quite often w what happens when people can't stop thinking and they most most people will complain of having like a knot in the solar plexus mm. or distent peri umbilical distension or something like that. And that there is an actual congealing of of fluids or at least slowing down of peristalsis, which then results in food becoming fetid and producing gas. Yeah, yeah. So like there's there's a very reasonable like like Western correlatives with what the Chinese are describing when they're saying overthinking causes binding. Yeah. Um, and, but that's why then I would say, okay, well, if, you, if, if overthinking is a problem for you, then I need to look at your digestion and that's where I will treat you because ultimately the more this binds, then that disease process that's, that, that might have been started up here is going to be affecting up here and making it harder to, for this to unbind. Makes sense. So, um, so yeah. It's an interesting kind of uh, metaphorical parallel where there's physical binding and there's mental binding being stuck in this repetitive thought process. Yeah, I and mean, that's exactly <clears throat> it. It's it's really it's it's kind of poetic actually to look at obsessive thinking as actually being like binding. Mm -hmm. It's you're literally stuck on it. Yeah, and then that happens in your body. Yeah, where your your intestines slow down, food backs up, and mucus collects or water collects in the stomach or all kinds of things like that which then actually produce feelings of fullness and of and um palpable and visible distension mm. wow okay well very cool so you said that most common things you treat are something to do with the gi system as well as with pain let me double check what i found because i did a little bit of research before you and i were going to hang out and i also treat i treat other things as well i just think those are the most common but but treat urological symptoms as well, and, and psychological symptoms too. Insomnia is a common one that we treat. Insomnia, okay, interesting. Yeah. Because it seems to me like the vast majority of uh, Western medicine studies that I've read, uh, which is, by the way, it's amazing. If you have not looked at the NIH, National Institute of Health, in the United States, there is just this ever-growing set of meta-analyses and randomized controlled clinical trials for TCM. Mm -hmm. And that's that's great, because I remember a time when you and I were talking, and it's like, no one's really researching this, but years later, it seems like people are actually researching this, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal. I think a big reason for that, actually, is the opioid epidemic that's taking place. Uh, because, you know, in the last 20 years, our primary, our, the primary Western pharmacological approach to pain was opiates. And unfortunately, that's created a whole generation of people who are addicted to them. Right. And without opiates, there's kind of like there's kind of a like we don't know what to do for you. Yeah. They're they're trying like much higher dosages of NSAIDs and things like that to mm -hmm. some benefit. Mm -hmm. But really, the the problem with pain management has, is a huge gaping hole in Western medicine, and it has led to this kind of um, flourishing of alternative and complementary therapies. Not, not just Chinese medicine, of course, but Chinese medicine included. Absolutely, and I would say, uh, me, from what I read at least, Chinese medicine especially, because I have a number of meta-analyses here basically from the last three years, 2014, 2017, basically, um, that are all very, very, very thorough, that basically talk about lower back pain, neck pain, 
uh, abdominal pain being just much more effective than placebo, especially on the, in, when it comes to acupuncture. Mm -hmm. um, the, a few caveats from the Western medicine side of things is something related to the idea that there's no set of established formulas that people use for randomized controlled clinical trials. Mm. So there are studies that use different herbal preparations, but because there's no set of consistent, like, Always. Tunnel, right, right. right <laughs> that they're very, very speculative about, you know, what's the point of toxicity, what's not the point of toxicity, da, 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 and how do you, how do you take all those nuances and let's say codify them and systematize them? That's partially why acupuncture has become so popular and herbalism has not, which I always puzzled over because I felt that herbalism should have been more popular as it's based on chemistry and much much easier to understand than the the, the, the magic voodoo of acupuncture. And, and, and yet it was just kind of discarded. And then I had a, an interesting conversation with somebody who was like, the, the biggest problem is that you can't control it. Yeah. Um, any, and, any from year to year, the crop could be told that the environmental conditions that yielded a crop could be different, and that means that the chemical constituents are all different. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the, the, the problem of standardization is a big problem for herbalism if you consider it a problem. But if you look at the Chinese medical literature, standardization was almost never at practice in Chinese medicine, right? Mainly because the approach of Chinese medicine, as you may or may not know, is almost uh, there's almost never a case where we use single herbs. It does happen, but single herbs in the same way that single molecules mm. um, produce side effects. Right. And so, though I would argue that from the Chinese perspective, they're not. it's not so much that there are side effects, it's more that there are other pathological conditions taking place in the person's body that would be aggravated by what this substance does. Makes sense. And so then formulas will range from four to eight to 12 to even 20 herbs sometimes mm. because they're trying to accommodate for all the different um, symptoms that a person might have. And um, as such, as one person who might have, and this goes back to nosology being really important, right. two people coming with uh, IBS as their diagnoses, one's gonna be constipated, one's gonna be diarrhea, which is a very gross difference between the two, which is obviously recognized by Western medicine as IBS-C and IBS-D. Right. But even within the same two IBSD cases, you might have somebody who has watery diarrhea who feels really cold all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you have somebody who has pasty malodorous diarrhea. Both have the IBSD diagnosis, but have completely different pathological processes from a Chinese perspective. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you could not use the same herbal formula for both because you'll right. end up hurting one of them. Right. That makes perfect sense to me. And I think that's probably one of the problems with Western medicine in this regard when it comes to um, non-virus and non-bacteria based issues is that we're trying to use a cookie cutter approach to things that are literally impossible to be categorized in a cookie cutter way. Amen. Right. So, and we have the same problem in psychology and in neuroscience where you can say someone has anxiety, but if you look at 10 different people who report a little bit of bodily tension, a little bit of worry. You're going to see totally different presence of catecholamines. You're going to see totally different presence of uh, cortisol in the person. You're going to see totally different wiring in different parts of the brain. So there's no like morphologically perfect replicable pattern for anxiety in the brain. There are some similarities that we like, but there's nothing perfectly similar. So I think we have a huge problem of like what we focus on yeah. in this way. It's um, even in even when I treat anxiety, it it's challenging because people will come in and they'll say I'm anxious, yeah, expecting me to know what that means. <laughs> and, and, uh, so I actually have to sit there and be like, can you tell me what that feels to you, what that feels like to you? And um, they'll they'll start saying, well, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. I'm like, I understand that you're worried about these things, but what does it feel yeah. like? And where do you feel it in your body? Right. Because ultimately, at least with my own experience with my own challenges with mental health was that my, when I was going through really terrible anxiety, the reason that anxiety was terrible was because it physically hurt. Yeah. I could point to you all the places in which my body was hurting as yeah. I was going through an attack. Right. 
So like that is clinically valuable, invaluable information actually, right. especially for Chinese medicine, but really it should be invaluable for all medicine. I would agree. No, absolutely. And I think that's why there is this kind of, I guess at this point, fifth wave movement away from more cognitive traditions, in, in, at least in my profession, and more towards the psychosomatic way of looking at things That's where exciting. somatic therapy, people like Peter Levin and, and stuff like that, really there is this movement of at least trying to either integrate more bodily awareness into what we do in the clinical world. However, you know, the medical model seems to predominate still and uh, people are very at least in my profession, very biased and very anxious about letting go of their preconceived notions about how to see things and treat things. So you know, it's the same. It's the same in Chinese medicine, as you said earlier. The only advantage that we really have um, is age. We've yeah. just gone. We I mean, there. You go back through the historical record, and you'll see sometimes the biggest revolutions in Chinese medical theory was because a lot of people were holding on to bad ideas and they right. were killing people or hurting people. Right. So like, um, it, it, it's nothing to be ashamed of that Western medicine is going through the same thing. And arguably Western medicine has a much better, um, uh, a much more effective system at approaching or tackling problems than Chinese medicine did in that the scientific model allows thing allows the, the allows for information, to be gathered at a much faster rate than Chinese medicine ever had. And so like, look at where Western medicine has come in the 300 years that it's been around, whereas Chinese medicine has taken thousands of years to mature to what it is. Right. And so it just, it, it's, it's just the normal growing pains that any, any theoretical system goes through. Sure. Sure. No, I, I agree with that. I think it's, it's, perfectly reasonable that this is the current state of affairs. I just find myself wondering, like, how long are we going to have to wait before people readily accept very logical propositions like the head bones connected to the neck bone? <laughs> right. Are you it, sure? It, yeah, right. I'm really well, not I'm sure not, about that. Just to be clear, I'm not a physician, <laughs> so I can't say that. But, you know, my understanding is that the head bones connected to the neck bone, etc. And it's, it's the same thing for muscles and tendons and nerves, etc. There's, you know, human. If you ever look, there's a really cool, creepy picture I always see on Facebook of just what a human's central nervous system is. If you strip away all the muscles, oh yeah, yeah, it's a really creepy picture, but it's a really cool picture because it, it gives you a very unique idea of like there are so many nerves and there's this just big interconnected web of things. It's not like there's a nerve here and then like inches later there's a nerve here that are not connected to each other. And I think if we start to actually own the fact and just acknowledge that this messy psychophysiological process is one, it might get a little easier to treat pretty much everything you look at and everything I look at. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a uh, an old old theory in Chinese medicine that actually distributed cognitive functions over the entire body. Right. Um, and it described various cognitive functions to different organs. Which interestingly, in modern research showing like the uh, the gut brain and the yeah. heart brain and stuff, there are there is now some some corroborating evidence to those ideas. Um, but I think really those ideas in Chinese medicine came more from they realized that various cognitive patterns produce predictable phys physical symptoms. Right. Like you know, if somebody has a panic attack and their heart races, they go, oh well, maybe then there's something actually happening here that's affecting here, or vice versa, or something. Right. I think that's where that idea came from. But nevertheless, it continues to be an important um, idea, even if it's not ostensibly true, just to illustrate that there are is far more con communication taking place between what is happening on a limited scale in our minds mm -hmm. and then what's happening on the macro scale of our bodies. I would agree. And I think this, this particular philosophy that you practice it does so much better than Western medicine to discuss the fact that they're literally all at the same time. You cannot have one without the other. There's no such thing. There's You, you don't like have just a little bit of pain and then some kind of mental issue at the same time. They have to be literally at the same time. And I think it is possible to have symptoms that, I mean, you can certainly have local symptoms from like traumatic injury and well, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, obviously. But. Um, but I think, I think it's more fair to say that 
once one happens, you are exponentially more likely to have the other one happen in a similar fashion. Right. I would that's how I would probably phrase it. I assume if you go out and you eat a pizza, which perhaps is one of the worst things that we could possibly eat. But pizza's eat. so good. It tastes so good. <laughs> but it's so bad for our digestive system because of the combination of ingredients. And you probably would feel kind of gross. And that literal feeling of grossness is both a psychological phenomenon and a physical, yeah. physiological phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that seems like an obvious statement to you and I, but I don't know that the average person would be like, eh, it's just, I feel bad. I feel physically bad. Right. I mean, arguably it is all physical anyway. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, then that's a separate conversation for a different talk. But, um, but nevertheless, you, it, it's amazing to see how many syndromes that are mentioned in the Chinese literature that contain emotional symptoms. Right. And even though the primary problem might be diarrhea, they're mentioning e emotional symptoms alongside it right. or, um, or urological symptoms with emotional symptoms, all kinds of things like that. Right. It's, it's truly remarkable. And so it definitely gives us a little more freedom of how we treat psychological conditions as opposed to, well, here's your antidepressant or your anxiolytic, you mm -hmm. know, like, and doesn't matter what kind of anxiety you have. Well, if this one doesn't work, then we'll try this other one mm -hmm. kind of thing. It, it gives us a little more freedom in that respect. Mm -hmm. Have you run into any issues with your practice nowadays in terms of um, either on the billing financial side or in terms of just people not accepting or pushing back against what you do? No, I definitely people will come with skepticism. Yeah. And rightfully so. I mean, this is a full, it's this medical model is completely foreign. And in every in every way, shape, or form. Literally, yes. It's literally foreign. <laughs> and so, like, and unfortunately, because of the history that we spoke about earlier, yeah. there's a great deal of misinformation about the system. Mm -hmm. And so people come in not understanding how a needle somewhere on their knee might be able to help their stomach. Um, they may not understand, like, they, well, hear the word chi, and God, if they hear the word chi, it's, it's done, you know, like. That's a That's the magic word. That's the magic word. Yes. Gee, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> well, if you want to get into that, yeah, right. Um, but nevertheless, if they hear, you know, they hear some of the medical terminology that we use, you have to remember that the, this medical terminology was was coined two thousand years ago. You, it's a special. It, not only is it is it in a foreign language being translated into English, it's being translated across time because it was two thousand it was written two thousand years ago. Right. It's being translated across cultures and then it's being translated across specialties. Like if you took somebody from an, another you took somebody from a thousand years into the future mm -hmm. and Western medicine or medicine is just completely different and they mm -hmm. come across an old Western medical text, old meaning today's Western medical text, and old. they read the word inflammation. And they have no idea what that what this language is really saying. Mm -hmm. They're going to look at the term inflammation and say, "Oh my God, these people were on fire," because <laughs> literally the term inflammation is on fire. On fire. So then, when you look at Chinese medical literature and you look at something like um, "gan hua," which literally means liver fire, like people are going to be like, "This is batshit crazy." <laughs> But you just have to take a moment, take a breather, and remember this is 2,000 years old. It's it's a different language. It's a different culture. But Ugh. that that is just a name referring to a set of symptoms. Right. And those symptoms are observable no matter what culture you come from. And no what labels what you use. use. And what labels you use. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's the thing that I, I've appreciated the most when I, I speak with you about all this is it's it's so readily obvious to me that this way of thinking about medical issues is simply a much more systematic and metabolic perspective on what I would consider common pathology mm -hmm. for most people. And that I find particularly um, at least praiseworthy because... We are just so caught up in this, what you said, a single pathogen problem. And I cannot imagine how our, our lives would just dramatically change if we could just be like, hmm, maybe the head bone is connected to the next bone. I mean, I don't want to detract from the pathogen problem because it has saved innumerable lives. Sure, washing and your hands is a good thing, as I understand it. <laughs> Even antibiotics have saved innumerable lives. Sure. But, I, and like, like, 
I lost that point. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you're thinking. Yeah. But, um, like, look, okay, I remember my point. I would also like to say that as beautiful and wonderful and incredible as Chinese medicine is, Western medicine can do things Chinese medicine never dreamed of. Like? Um, heart transplants. Okay. That's remarkable. Yeah. Um, uh, cancer treatments. Or especially for early screening, because like for Chinese medicine, if you look at the historical record, the only time they'd ever be able to diagnose cancer is once it was visible or palpable. Right. And, you know, I've read some studies that show that it's a very useful adjunct of treatment. For sure. Definitely. I'm not going to say you can't treat cancer with Chinese medicine, but it should never be your only course of action. Right. Um, that being said, like the the ability to screen cancer mm -hmm. with, with Western medicine is exponentially better than mm -hmm. Chinese medicine. Um any a treatment of any infectious disease, really. I mean, if 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 uh, any 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 bacterial infectious disease, really, mm -hmm. you just, it, it's just easier to go with Western medicine. However, there's a lot of research being done in herbal therapy right now for um, for uh, antibiotic resistant uh, pathogens. Okay, and there is some promise there. And I actually recently listened to a podcast from a, a high school girl did a, did a did a science fair project where she actually. Um, took extracts of various Chinese herbs and she she tested them against antibiotics on various bacterial strains. I can't remember what strain she did. And when accounting for the fact that the bacterial or the uh, herbal strains are are a, a collection, they're a compound, they're not a single molecule. Um, once you account for that, some of one herb in particular actually showed to be more effective than the standard anti antibiotic. Oh. So there's a lot of promise in that area. Interesting. Um, and so that's that's one of the nice things about the current the, the, the current age of being able to blend east and west together. That's cool. But I would do want to argue that that the value of Chinese medicine is not so much in the medicinal substances nor the therapies. I'm sure it's really nice to be able to look at a 500 year old text and say, well, this herb was used to treat malaria, and then isolate that compound and then win a Nobel Prize. It was a Chinese medical doctor who or a re medical researcher who won the Nobel Prize for isolating artemisian, which is a... Yeah, 2015, I just yeah, saw that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Happened a few years ago, and she won the Nobel Prize for creating a new antimalarial drug, and that was based on re research from medical literature, Chinese medical literature. Which is amazing. Really amazing. Um, that's all really, really cool. But I just don't want to see Chinese medicine being relegated to Western medicine, because I think the value of Chinese medicine is really its theories and ideas mm more than actually its therapies. Okay. You know, um, I guess that's a, a reasonable, let's say, want, you know, for someone who practices because most people do get protective of the philosophy and the belief system that they have, for sure. Uh, I can't imagine Western medicine taking it over. I can imagine greed. It is. I can imagine greed taking it over. I can't imagine... For both. <laughs> yeah, which one, though? Chicken and the egg. No, we'll say at this point now um, you have a lot of a lot of people clawing at our physical therapy, our manual therapy, such as um, cupping, gua sha, which is using um, a spoon or or a special tool to scrape along the skin. Oh yeah, like physical therapists, massage therapists, anybody who does manual therapy, they're stealing, stealing. They're they're taking, using cupping. They're using gua sha, um, and now you have physical therapists. Taking you know short, short seminar courses to learn acupuncture, and they call it dry needling. Uh, and so you actually see, as Chinese medicine grows in acceptance in the West, you're seeing all of the Western traditions that used to shun us just turn around and be like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Right, right. Which is why, again, I think that the value of Chinese medicine, why Chinese medicine will not dissipate in the face of that, is because the value of Chinese medicine is how we actually view the body. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you in that way, and I understand your concern that um, it is being stolen, so to speak. It's, I mean, it's not being stolen. They don't know what they're doing. Right, and I think that is a... <laughs> I'm probably a, so douchey. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. No, 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 it's the truth. Again, it's like anyone can make an herbal preparation. Anyone can do talk therapy. That, that's the corollary. It's, it's, just, it's not that simple, and if you really want to do something and you really want to help people, I think you have to go through extensive training and understand from top to bottom why people think the way they think and why they do every little thing that they do with regard to any kind of medicinal practice whether it's hell it could be fucking yoga 
Like, if you're going to do yoga, you shouldn't just know how to stretch. It's not just stretching. Stretching is a fundamental component of yoga, yeah. but there are thousands of years of thoughts, beliefs, practices, failures and successes, etc., that you need to be aware of. You can't just, you know, look good in the, as J.P. Spears talks about, you can't just look good in yoga pants and stretch really nicely and call yourself a yoga teacher. That's pretty fucking stupid because all you're going to do is hurt people. But if you actually take some legitimate time, invest some real cognitive effort and finances and thoughts and feelings and, and energy into what does it actually mean to do yoga, maybe you'll help some people. Yeah. Especially yeah. For, for herbal therapy, because in the United States, herbal herbal supplements are, are herbs and herbal medicinal substances are classified as food supplements, which means anybody can buy them. And anyone can make them. Anybody can make them. Mm -hmm. Anybody can prescribe them. Like you don't need a license to do that. Oh. And like, arguably, like if I just wanted to be an herbalist, I shouldn't have gotten my license because then I'm at risk of like malpractice and stuff right. like that. And I could lose my license and that would be terrible. Uh, but anybody can do this and everybody, and anybody does. That's why you have, you have all kinds of companies selling all kinds of ridiculous herbal things. Right. The, the important thing I think is any, any herbal, any herbal supplement that is ultimately being mined from a traditional system has to be understood from the context of its system. And it shouldn't be haphazardly um, ascribed to Western medicine pathological conditions. Because again, like we classify like Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, which is Indian medicine, um, Him Himalayan medicine from like, you know, Bhutan, Nepal, um, Tibet, yeah. uh, Unani, which is the, con the current day iteration of Greek and Galenic medicine. Okay. All of these, have very specific ways they understand the body to work and when it's appropriate to use these substances. Okay. And so like the example of that I gave earlier of ginger feeling really good when somebody has a cold, ginger can be can can be a a, a a godsend for somebody who feels really cold and it can completely aggravate somebody who's feeling really hot. Right. Somebody has inflammatory skin conditions um, may not want to be taking ginger. Right. Even if even if like they do have upset stomach, for instance, and ginger's you know the, the household cure for upset stomach, you have to be clear that your upset stomach is a a quote cold pathology, mm -hmm. in which case using a, a thermogenically warm herb is going to make you feel better. Right. Otherwise, if your stomach is upset actually because it's hot, if you take that, you're gonna make your stomach worse and concurrently you might make acne worse or you might make herpes simplex worse, or you might make any number of inflammatory skin conditions worse. Right. And so, like, this idea of Western diagnosis, this herb just does not work. Right. And I think that's why I would rather leave it to professional to figure it out. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're past an hour here, and I want to be mindful of the time. I just want to know, kind of before we wrap up, if there's anything that you want to talk about that we've uh, missed. So just a side note. I did a little looking around. There's there are roughly like 50 accredited schools for TCM, and there are like 140 for medical practitioners. I find it fascinating that there are roughly three times the number for medical doctors and 50 for TCM here in the United States. Do you think that should be a, that ratio should change? Do you think it'd be useful if we had more people who went through all the systematic study that you went through and or I mean, should I get scandalous and like should I expose the dark underbelly of Chinese medical education? Oh, that's all education. <laughs> all of them are greedy. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Caveat. Every school, whether they're a public university, a private university, they're all interested in making money. From Harvard to University of Missouri, where I went, to private schools where you and I both went for our advanced degrees, all of them want to make money and all of them do shady things. So, mind blown. Um, I would say that. I think Chinese medicine should definitely have a more prominent place in our culture. Okay. I think there's, I think there's um, institutional problems though in how it's being taught that um, would need to be addressed before I would just say, yes, let's just exponentially increase schools. Okay. That would be my diplomatic way of saying that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we can have a private conversation about that. <laughs> well, I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you for anyone who's come on out. Anyone who watches, this is... Lauren Seitler, wonderful, wonderful acupuncturist and 
practitioner of TCM. Uh, you have a website. You want to talk about where people can find you on Facebook and whatnot? Yeah, I have a I have a Facebook business page, which is just Steitler Med. That's my last name, which is S T I T E L E R M E D. Um, you can follow you can follow me there, or I have an Instagram account, which is also Styler Med, where I post about Chinese medical ideas and pictures and things like that. So those would be two good places that you can also reach out to me if you have any questions or want to talk about Chinese medicine. And if you're in the LA area, where can they find you? Where you practice? I practice primarily in Woodland Hills, but I also am one day a week in West Hollywood. Okay. So this is Lauren Satter. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you. And have a good Sunday. See you in a month with a new guest.